it's good to be here this morning. It's uh, it's good to wake up in the morning and look out and see a new day come. And uh, as we were driving up this morning, I, I just thought of a, an old song. And I hadn't thought of it for a long, long time. And maybe I should have thought of it more as we used to sing it. Have I done any good in the world today? Have I helped anyone in need? Have I cheered up the sad and made someone feel glad? If not, I have failed indeed. Has anyone's burdens been lighter today? Because I was willing to share. Have the sick and the weary been helped on their way? When they needed my help, was I there? Then wake up and do something more than dream of your mansions above. Doing good is a pleasure, a love beyond measure, a blessing of love. And folks, I used to like the melody, and it took a long while before I got the words through. And that's where we are right now. Without that love, we're in trouble. And we're getting into a time where without that love, we're in lots of trouble. <laughs> we have got superior beings. I, I have worked with atheists who say, yeah, I just happened. Holy cow. <laughs> they just happened to be nuts. <clears throat> Here we have got an entire body that is so beautifully built and so delicate and so intricate and so marvelous. Why shouldn't we follow the instruction manual for the vehicle? And where is our instruction manual? It's the scriptures, you bet. The old scriptures and the new scriptures. And when anybody speaks from the Lord, and you know that's where it comes from. That's some of the newest of the new scriptures. We've lost a lot of ours. As you know, the Bible isn't what it originally was. But we used to have the book of herbs. And the book of herbs was one of the greats in the Bible. We miss it. One day it will be established again. But in our Latter-day Scriptures, we're given these instructions and some of the information that was lost in the book of Herbs. And one of the things that we have got to stop and think about is the fact that it tells us the very types of foods that we eat and where we're going to get them. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1. 29 and 30. It says, and the Lord speaking now, he's the one that built this vehicle. If we had trouble with our Ford car and we lived next door to Henry, we'd go over to Henry and say, hey, this fool thing isn't working right. No, oh, I can fix that in a hurry. I built it. I know how to fix it up. All right, the good Lord built this. And so, he tells us now, how to keep it in good condition. And in Genesis, he says, I give you all green seed-bearing herbs, seed-bearing herbs, to be used as meat for man, meat is fuel, meat for man, and meat for the beasts of the fields. He even goes way back when the lamb will lie down with the lion part. But he tells us the whole thing. It's right there for us. And what are seed-bearing herbs? The herb, actually, as you'll be learning in the classes that uh, we have, ranges from the smallest microscopic herb that is hard to detect to the largest mustard tree or sequoia tree. These are all seed-bearing. And many of these seeds look so much alike that it's hard to tell what type of plant it is. 
the seed from the mustard tree is a tiny little seed, extremely small. And yet the mustard seed grows, develops into the largest tree known on earth today. The mustard tree is an ancient from the Asian area, and it's one of the largest trees. But it all comes from the seed. And what comes around the seed? Something to nourish it, something to take care of it and sustain it. And so around each one is the fruit, the vegetable, the grain, and that are the seed. And that will also nourish or sustain us. And it's there for us to use. The herbs are divided down the middle. On this side, we have the nutritional herbs. On this side, we have the medicinal herbs. Ezekiel tells us of this, Ezekiel 47 and 12, says, And the fruit of the tree shall be for meat, and the leaf thereof for medicine. He's trying to tell us that if we eat the fruits, we can live a thousand years. And if we don't, some herb doctor had to mix up a batch of leaves, <laughs> straighten us out. And this is the truth. It works just this way. The fruit of the tree itself will sustain us, providing, now catch this, that we eat the fruit properly. That's one of the keys in the New Scriptures that was in the herb book, Book of Herbs. Every herb in its wholesome state, get that word wholesome, one of the most terrific words has ever been put in the English language, wholesome. When you look it up in Webster's Unabridged, it says wholesome means with the life therein as in its original state, with the life therein. All right, how are we going to get long life? By eating live food. And live food is the key of keys. And live food is why we're here to learn how to get long life. When I say a thousand years, you think I'm doing it tongue in cheek, I know. But I'm not. From the time of Adam down to Noah, men lived 800, 900. Methuselah, 969 years. Right up to that thousand year mark. And what did they eat? From the time of Adam down to Noah, there was no history of meat eating. There was no history whatsoever. And if you don't believe in the scriptures, if you happen to be atheistic, get a historian. Get Josephus. And if you read Josephus, you'll find he isn't as scriptural as many of the other readings. He's kind of a hard-headed historian. And he will tell you that same story from Adam down to Noah. There is no history of meat-eating. And the history of meat-eating started at the time that the flood had washed the ark over to Mount Ararat, and after they had been living there for the 40 days, the ark landed on Mount Ararat, and when it landed, it landed in the sterile area, sea washed, no vegetation. Now in our own Latter-day Scripture, I happen to be a Mormon, and it says there very plainly, Meat is to be used during times of, get this, cold, winter, and famine. Now, it wasn't cold or it wasn't winter, but it was famine. They had no vegetation. They had to eat meat. Well, the Lord wrote the book in the first place, and, and so when the time for the play comes out, which it was now with Noah there and his group, he had warned them to put two of the unclean animals on board ship, but to put seven of the clean. And why seven of the clean? Because the good Lord knew that they were going to land in the sterile area. 
and they would have to turn to meat to eat. And so they did. And they had the seven of the clean. They started to work on them. And they enjoyed it. And in three generations, they got to a point where they were heavy meat eaters. Now you see, this is an interesting thing. Something happens to you when you start eating a certain type of materials of this type. Anything that is a strong drink or a strong food that is habit forming. Anything that is strong. Well, meat happens to be a strong food, as is bread is a strong food. There are men who have killed other men to get a loaf of bread when they could have gotten something else, but they wanted bread. This particular principle now of strong food, they started eating the meats, they enjoyed it, and then they got to a point where, now this is a technical term, you'll have to check it out and look it up, but they got hooked. <laughs> and when they got hooked, they had a hard time getting off, and that's why you and I still have a little meat, potato, and gravy running in our veins. It carried on down. And with red meat comes death. And this is one thing that we'll be giving to you straight. And there is plenty to back us up. Red meat is death itself. Up until the time of Noah, they could live up to a thousand years. But in three generations, get that, in three generations, they dropped from a thousand years to a hundred and twenty was the lifespan. In three generations. Everyone that comes to us as patients go on our basics which are number one, as we have mentioned before, a gallon of steam distilled water a day. Number two, clean out the bowel. Number three, clean up the bloodstream. This is extremely important, but they must go on the three-day cleanse every 30 days. Three days of juice every 30 days. And the mucus's diet. Well, he had followed through on this. And in this program, he had tapered from one small bowel movement, sometimes once a day, to five to seven, and he leveled it off to better than three bowel movements a day the rest of his time, as long as I knew him. Three bowel movements or more, and they do not have to be formed. They can be a spore type. When they are formed, it means there is still mucus in there and it's doing too much forming. And this we want to eliminate as much as possible. We've got now a formula that should be with every one of your patients, every one of your friends, to number one, clean them out because their 90% of all disease starts in the bowel. Then the bloodstream with your red clover combination, and then give them the fruits, vegetables, grains, nuts, and seeds in their wholesome state. And you have got the program on the road. Now let me tell you what the lady had to t for the rest of her story. Thank you. The two years... <coughs> Past. And during that period of time, she started to feel better. And during the time, she went to her doctor and said, uh, give me an examination. I think I'm feeling better. He examined her and said, well, that's odd. The cancer's all gone except a little showing on the pap smear. And she said, all right, I'll go back and I'll work it over. Next time she came back, it wasn't on a pap smear. Then she found she was completely healed. Completely healed. 
And how did she get healed? I asked her. I was the nosy one now. She wasn't uh, bothering me at all. I was now bothering her. What did you do about it? Well, she said, when I got home, after I had been told that they were going to remove most of my organs, I sat down and I knew there was something wrong, but I didn't know what it was because I know nothing about medicine. I know nothing about foods, herbs, or anything. And she said, you know, <coughs> the good Lord talked to me. He just told me I wasn't eating right. She said, I... had that much information. I wasn't eating right. And so she said, I changed my diet. Oh, what did you do? And she said, well, I ate fruits, vegetables, grains, nuts, and seeds. As many raw as possible. And the rest were low heated or pre-soaked. It took me 40 years to get this through my thick skull. 40 years, and the Lord told her, now. And I thought, gee, where's there any justice here? Huh? I'd work my tail off, and she guessed it just accidentally. Or was it? No, she asked with faith. She had enough love in her heart that she knew she was going to get an answer, and she got it. And she got a beautiful answer. Now there are some things that we eliminate from our diet. Now these things that we eliminate, the sad part is they are things that our taste bud says, oh boy, you have wit, don't drop those. And it's there. The number one thing, and one of the hardest ones to break, is salt. Salt. Do you know that if you take some salt in your hand, you notice how small those little grains are? Count 20 of those grains out. And the average individual cannot assimilate more than 20 grains in a 24-hour period. More than that, it's accumulative. And accumulation is where your eyes go off on you because it causes hardening of the arteries, and that's one of the first places it spots, and then it will cause trouble throughout the entire body. Salt is vicious, and if you want to get away from it, there are ways. You can get a Bronner's or Dr. Jensen's natural salt. Now, this is actual salt. This is pure salt, but it's a different kind of salt. It's salt from the herb thereof. They, they take your vegetation and dehydrate it and take the salt out of it there and it's still live organic salt. We eliminate sugar and sugar products. We do not cross out honey, maple syrup, properly made, blackstrap, properly made. These are acceptable. We are talking about refined sugars. These are so vicious, and very few people realize how bad they are. But the first thing they do, as they go into solution, the first place they hit is the vein. And when they hit the vein, they have the power of drawing, leaching from the vein, the natural calcium. The sugar versus calcium is vicious and it causes varicosity. When a woman is nursing a baby, drinking a lot of pop, sugars in her coffee, etc., 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 a lot of pastries, that baby is going to suffer. The mother will suffer. This, this is a sad thing, but it can be changed. Well, here, our next one, is, of course, the one we've talked about before, is meat. Every cancer patient 
is the number one to be pulled off of meat because red meats that is a food for cancer we all know these things we keep away from red meats because they are killers and sooner or later we'll come around to the program of living on live food here we have got with our meats trouble and there is never anything but trouble there there are books written on it and we'll we'll get you more material on this but if you want to clear the body of cancer if you want to clear the body of any types of diseases number one cut out the red meats number two cut out your sugars of course can you uh, cut them off the red meat right away or should you do it in, in progression? Uh, our, our program has been over the years to meat eaters is to cut the red meat and stay on chicken and poultry for a short period of time and then taper them off gradually. The next one is milk. Milk is the one of the rough ones of all times because people feel that they cannot live without milk. They have been told from early times that milk is a natural food and a most complete food. It is. Now back that up. Even the scriptures tell us milk is for the baby. Meat is for man and now the Lord has given you all green seed bearing herbs to be used as meat. But milk is for the baby. Now let's come right down to cold facts and figures. Does it talk about a zebra mother nursing a human baby? or a kangaroo nursing a human baby, that's all milk, or a mare, etc., etc., etc. No, like begets like, and we will never be able to get satisfaction and healthy lines by using milk from another animal. There's one other item that we leave out of the diet, Flour and flour products. Now this, of course, hits everybody hard. <laughs> this, this is really hard to take because, but really, we're not against grain. Grain is the great food of all times. But that grain must be kept whole, uncracked, pre-soaked and low heated before it's ready to use. You will find this just as a proof. You can take soy milk, which is an acid five from the dry soy being made up. And it, we nearly lost one boy with it. We didn't know any better. So we gave him soy milks. If that had been pre-soaked and low heated and the milk made of it, terrific. Now there is your difference. It would have been okay. Parker, are you familiar with the live stream seam bread? Yes. What do you think of that because it's crushed? I can give you the test, and I haven't made this test yet. One of these days I will. But the test is put it <laughs> put put it in in uh, furrow number two. <laughs> Well, no, what I'm. <laughs> well, that's a good way around it. But if it'll grow, if it'll grow, fine. But I'll tell you this: you could take any type of flour, whole wheat, or raw, or any kind you wish, and uh, plant it, and it will not grow, because as you break the kernel. Now, this is important. As you break that hermetically sealed kernel of the wheat, you have let air in, oxygen in, and the very life that's in that is killed. And why is it killed? Because the only way it can sustain life is to be matured through moisture, just like in the mother itself. That grain must be pre-soaked and eventually your life then will come. Vitamin 
D is so important, we've got to have the rays of the sun. This is one of the most important things I can tell you now. Never have that patient go against instructions, because the instructions are, for the blonde, one minute front, one minute back of sunbathing. And sunbathing doesn't mean with fur coat and galoshes on. Get a private place and be just as brief as possible. All right, for the brunette, two minutes front, two minutes back. That sun will feel so good, they'll want to go another minute. Or a little longer, anyhow. We generally recommend a nine foot bull whip. <laughs> and this is to be used if they don't snap too. When it's time to come in out of that sun, they're out. Because we cannot afford third degree burns. The body is not in a condition to support additional trouble. The second day, it is two minutes for the blonde and four minutes for the brunette. And we add one minute a day for the blonde, two minutes for the brunette. We can't stick to blonde and brunette because once in a while we have a brunette that will blister <laughs> quicker than a blonde. And uh, I had one blonde patient that never burned, and I couldn't understand this one either. Now you can notice by adding a minute or two minutes a day, six days a week, week after week, you're up to an hour before too awfully long. And this is important. If you don't think the sun is important, why, you've been reading too many of the national publications that say, don't sunbathe, it causes cancer. Hmm. There can never be cancer made unless there's cancer there in the first place. We are talking on the principle of preparing the body so that it can have long life. I'm going into a principle now that is uh, that is understood by many, and uh, it's time that it's understood by more. And that is the power of the human body operating on electricity. The human body, surely we have to eat, we have to do a lot of things to keep it going, but it is powered by an electrical energy 35 years ago, I was teaching this, that uh, sure, we have to use certain foods and certain herbs and uh, different things, but unless the body was kept clean, the electrical energy would not do the job that it was supposed to do. Well, I was quite highly ridiculed by an electrical engineer who told me that the thing was a fallacy. And I said, I don't care how you feel about it. I know that's the truth. Just before he died, not too long ago, he notified me that he wanted to talk to me. He said, we haven't seen each other for years. But he said, if you could come down to my laboratory, I'd be glad to spend some time with you if you can spare it. I will come, and I did. He said, you taught the principle years ago that the body operates on electrical energy. And he said, I ridicule it. But he said, since that time, he said, we have equipment finely enough calibrated that we can measure the number of amps or ohms that go into any specific organ of the body. And if we find that the liver or the heart, or the kidneys, are not using as many ohms or amps as they should, that they are in malfunction. 
and we have used it just the opposite of what you have said. We are now finding this is a diagnostic equipment. And he said, I wish to apologize. He said, because you were right from the very beginning. Now, this man was the one who invented the bouncing bomb. He was the one that transferred the German death ray during World War II to a life ray by reversing it. He did a lot of amazing things, but he was close to death before he finally found that we were accurate. And here is the principle. The atmosphere around us is a little congested here, but nevertheless, we have the universal power here. Prana, call it what you wish. It is over the entire atmosphere. Oftentimes you'll notice a small infant or a small child will be playing with another one that you can't see. But they will be talking back and forth and, and you think that you have a pixelated biological reproduction. Uh, it isn't that way at all. When born, we have a small opening in the top of the head, a soft spot. You know you don't go punching that. That soft spot finally grows in. But that is the opening for letting the prana or the universal power come into the body through this, which is the opening to the third eye. As the power comes in, it goes on into the brain, down the spine, and hits the chakras and covers the entire body with electrical energy. As the child grows, the soft spot becomes hardened and yet the pattern is left there and it is an open door and it can get the energy it needs through this area. But through improper living, we close that door. And that door is open with all of us if we we'll learn how to use it. This particular opening must be kept clean and clear. If it isn't, we are in trouble. We get the energy from the atmosphere and there's plenty for all of us. There's enough for everybody. And all we have to do is accept it. And it comes through the spine, through the chakras, but it has to be, and this is the important part, grounded out. If it is grounded out properly, we're fortunate because now we have a steady stream of electrical energy coming through the body, feeding it with electrical power and out through the ground. Do you know, it hasn't been too long uh, since the uh, Japanese had outlawed rubber sole shoes for their children. And this was an illegal thing to put rubber sole shoes on Japanese children because they knew of this electrical uh, flow. It is, is so important. We should have our shoes and stockings off and going barefooted in either the lawn or in soil or sand or something every day. This makes the contact far better if we will keep it going clear. People have come to me with insomnia so many times. I have had so many patients of all ages. They walk the floor all night. They can't sleep. Afraid they're having to go to the asylum. I remember one old gent down in southern Utah. He was up around 80 years of age, and he had walked the floor every night, month in and month out. It wasn't only hard on him, but he was irritating the whole family. They'd be kept awake with him walking the floor. His son had heard one of my lectures and had passed the word on to the old gent. And the old fellow wouldn't do it for some time. So one night he was so beside himself, he said, all right, I'll do it. Can I just take my shoes off and go in my stocking feet on the floor here? And the son said, Dad, if you're going, let's go. 
He took him by the hand and took him outside. He took off his shoes and stockings and he walked him around the lawn there for about 10 minutes. And the old gent hadn't slept for so many months except snooze for 15, 20 minutes and then wake back up again, walk the floor. The next morning, they had to awaken the old gentleman. He had slept all night long like a baby and they had to uh, get him to wake up. And we've had so many of these cases because when we get static electricity in our body, it loads in and the prana or intestinal or universal juice cannot go through. Why we are here, we are here to learn how to, without any effort, learn the principles of love. Learn the principles that can raise our vibration. The human body has a vibration that is precious, but it happens that this vibration can be measured in hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands if you've got the instruments finely enough calibrated to do the job. I was reading a report from some scientists who had a machine that took the vibrations in the hundreds. And they found out that when an individual had a low vibration of 150 to 200, they were people who would easily catch disease. They would um, just uh, pick it up without any effort at all. But when they raised the vibration by proper living and eating properly and being happy to three to four hundred, they found out that they didn't catch every cold that came around the corner. At five and six hundred, they got to a point where they were tapping into the fourth dimensional and they could understand the messages that were coming from higher evolved substances and they were more happy, more satisfied people. But by the time they got to the 800, they were ready to take on fourth dimension. They were ready to go to a new type of living.